turn my phones off. <coughs> okay. Phones off, lights on, headphones in, microphone's working. Let me make sure it's checking out the right microphone. All right, cool. Here we go. All right. I know. Bye. Shake it out. Oh, wait. I think I got a burp going. <laughs> <laughs> Diet Coke got me. Hello, and welcome to Middleish, the podcast about moderation in all things. I am Michael Gray. And I am Aaron Green. How's it going, Aaron Green? Pretty good. Good. I. I didn't uh, have to introduce us, so I didn't did have it. a chance to fail right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just, I just, uh, just tried to say hello and welcome to Middleish, the podcast about moderation and all things, and it kind of went like, "Hello, welcome to Middleish." <laughs> <laughs> your your yeah. tongue got kind of tied up. It did. I should have untied it first. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay because it segues nicely into our topic today. Kind of perfectly, um, right? But yeah. we'll get there in a minute. How's things? Yeah. How's kicks? We're good. Just, yeah. uh, yep. Holiday baking still. I know this will be released after Christmas and the holidays, but you know, that's, uh, I'm, we're, we're getting very Christmassy here. Although it is supposed to be in the upper fifties in Boise today. Ooh. So I have an opportunity to take my new gravel bike out for a spin and I cannot wait. So yeah. I, I, rapidly shifted from like, yay, ski season to, <laughs> oh damn, it rained on the mountain yesterday. I guess I'm going to go on the bike. my bike. <laughs> That's pretty warm for that. That's nice. Yeah. It's really warm. And then we get a cold snap again next week. So of course that's the way it goes while there. You can. Yep. 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 You get the same weather for about three days. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and then I, I have a blood donation appointment this afternoon. And so I'm trying to get the bike ride in before I go do that. Be careful. You only have a limited amount of blood. <laughs> of blood. So, yeah. I think that was an office body... reference. <laughs> Not enough you've got there yet. I think you've got there. It was an office reference. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't Aaron's, know. I mean, Aaron's plugging her way to the office before Netflix removes it. So there's so many punchlines that <laughs> I keep thinking like a, a brilliant one will come across and I'll be laughing and I'll be like, I'm going to use that one in a sentence. Like I'm totally going to reference that one. And then I forget because then another brilliant punchline comes across. Mm -hmm. So, and what's great about it is you get, if you watch it enough, you kind of like get used to those ones that are the real obvious <laughs> ones. And then you begin to see that there's like usually a couple around them that are just as good, but you totally missed. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of, a lot of depth of funny to that show. <laughs> this is why it's important to watch the entire, what, nine seasons all the way through a yeah. dozen times like you have? Is that why? Probably more than a dozen, to be honest. <laughs> I bet I've watched through all of them. I bet 14 or 15 times. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I can't, well, what I would love is I always find comedy funnier around other people, especially when people get Shared the experience. comedy. Yes. Um, for example, <clears throat> Matt found, uh, something came across his Instagram that was just this funny little reel and it has a lot of profanity in it. So I will not repeat it, but it was the dumbest thing, but for some reason he, it struck him as funny and he was crying, laughing, even when he showed me like later that evening, he saw it in the morning <laughs> and he's like, I got to show you this thing. And he shows me. And I was I was kind of like, that's so weird. Like random, why unprovoked? What's going on with all this? And he was like <laughs> crying, laughing. So back to the office reference. I yes. think that the humor is really great when you share it with people. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. It's watch just, other people laugh. Yep. Yep. I think everything, most thing, most experiences are better shared with mm -hmm. someone. Yeah. Most. Most. Not all, Not all of them. <laughs> yes, we won't get into that, but most. <laughs> All right. Hey, anybody want to play? What are they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> anybody have anything? an example out there? Anyone yeah. have an example they want to share? <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, How are right. you? What's uh, what's I'm going good. on in your world? Um, just you know, we're on Christmas break here, so um, I mean, Lada's been home, you know, even in school, but no school, so um, yeah, just kind of more laid back days a little bit because there's not, you know getting up as early, um, for everybody else, but me, cause I'm still training early in the morning. Um, mm-hmm. so everybody else gets to sleep in a bit, uh, just, you know, more relaxed mornings. Um, it's kind of like a weekend, you know, every day, which is nice. Um, don't have to get breakfast going as early, you know, um, yeah, it's a little not, break. Yeah. Not getting on, you know, watching the clock as closely for online school and making sure Lada's on when she's supposed to be and that kind of stuff. So it's good. Girls are just counting down just a couple of days till Christmas and yeah, we're very much ready. So sweet. Yeah. Four days. Is it four, four days? Yeah. Cause today's the 21st, right? Dang. Yeah. As of recording. I know. Yeah. It's wild. It's wild, man. It's a scene. <laughs> Tell you what. So today's topic. Yeah. Fear. I mean, we we already failure. used up our segue, so let's just dive in. Let's do, yep. let's, let's do an awkward. We had a really good segue earlier, so now we're going to go clunky. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> on to today's topic. <laughs> Fear, Fear of failure. failure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we've all experienced it. Do you have a, a story of when you've <clears throat> experienced it? Uh, the fear of failure? Oh Mm -hmm. man. Yeah. I mean, we all have, I'm sure we have tons, but yeah. Um, let's see, do I go a humorous route or more serious? Let's go more serious. And this, I guess this is one that's still, I'm still going through and I've been going through for like nine years. So I would say, um, being a parent, right? Like, Oh boy. Yeah. Like when Kathleen was pregnant with Lila and just knowing that was common and, the closer you get, the more that reality sets in. Like, I have no idea how to do this, yeah. <laughs> right? Like there's no manual. There's no like anything like that. It's just one day it's like, here's a human being. Now go raise it. <laughs> and it's a Good little, luck. Over- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, just going into that whole situation was terrifying. Um, and because I, yeah, I don't know that there's anything more important that I'll do then raise human beings who go out into the world and do things, you know what I mean? And impact other people and have lives. And it's just a massive responsibility. And, and you, there's like no training. Like I've had no. more like, like training for the dumbest jobs, you know, like there's just zero training. I mean, you can How to run books. a copy machine or something. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, we read how to make books. a latte, like, <laughs> yeah, but raising right? a, raising a human, like there's no book for that. Just, just go do it. Wing it. So, I, I mean, I think there was just immense fear around failing at that. And I think there still is a lot for me. Um, just because like the goalposts are always moving, right? Like you kind of get good at parenting at a certain age and then everything changes and they're a different person mm. and the ways you communicate don't work anymore. And the ways, you know, you got them to kind of listen and follow directions don't work anymore. And they have, you know, a new kind of space of where they are cognitively and just everything changed. You're like, okay, here we go. Let's figure it all out again. Um, but so I guess I say all that to say that I, I, I begin to begun to, kind of embrace the failures in that and not that I'm really okay with them, but I understand I'm going to screw it up, right? Like Mm -hmm. no matter how hard I try as a dad, like I'm going to get it wrong. And I'm probably going to, I mean, in reality, I'm probably going to do some damage to their childhood, you know, and I don't want to. And to me, that's not an excuse to just be like, whatever about it, but you know, if I, if I, if I go one way or the other, there's probably going to be some places where I go too far and, you know, and I do some damage, you know, that they're going to have to work out in therapy later, Um, you know, but I think just embracing that of like, you know, I know I'm doing my best and I know that um, when I make mistakes, and this was a hard thing, this is a hard lesson for me to learn, but when I make mistakes, I allow my kids to communicate that with me. And then I try to do better, you know? Um, 
And I think I've shared before, it was a time with Lila and I, like five years ago, four or five years ago, where we just were not in good sync. And she had said, you know, like, I just, I don't think daddy loves me. I don't think I love mm -hmm. daddy. I don't like daddy. And it wasn't terrible. It just, we weren't connecting in any way. And I was trying and bumbling, you know, whatever, but just learning from that experience, like, okay, you know, like I've got to do things differently now. And just mm -hmm. because, and this works for a lot of things with health and wellness and fitness, just because I was doing it in a way that worked for a while, doesn't mean it's always going to work that way. Right. So I've got to adapt and change and fall back and punt and figure out something else to do to make it continue to work, you know? Um, so I'm kind of getting off yeah, here. Sorry, that's a, but that's, no, that's, a, that's a big one, you know, that just parenting and going like, man, how do I not screw this up? And then realizing mm, you're gonna, yeah. And being okay and with that to a degree. That's a really good point though. I think parenting was one, of course, since I'm not a parent, it wasn't the first thing that came to my mind, but it's, I think it's even more challenging with this whole fear of failure concept because there's really no end game, right? You are parenting forever. It's, mm -hmm. it's not like you're setting a goal to, you know, do a race or to right. try to, you know, learn a new sport or to make it to a promotion in your job. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not like those kinds of goals. Right. It is truly just never ending. There's always going to be more yeah. that needs to be done and it's never going to be perfect. And that really speaks to, I think one of the main things behind a fear of failure, um, that, sort of vision or that expectation that you place on mm -hmm. whatever that thing is that you're going after, mm -hmm. whether it's you're picturing how good of a parent you're going to be or how you want your, you know, children to maybe grow and relate to you and other people in the world. You know, right. if you have a vision for how you are going to tackle some fitness goal or this, you know, new lifestyle change that you've decided to make, um, quitting smoking. I mean, mm -hmm. who knows there's, there's a thousand examples, but I think parenting really highlights that, that expectation that we get in our mind right. when we embark on a new goal or a new journey or something. I think a lot of times that is what feeds into that fear of failure, because what if I don't measure up to this bar that I've set for myself? Or mm -hmm. what if the vision turns out differently? And it could be, it could be really good still just different. It could not be as good as you envisioned. And we'll right. talk a little bit about how to deal with that, but there's, I think there's always that, um, that expectation and then a little bit of pressure that comes with that. And mm -hmm. for some people, they just, they'll completely freeze mm -hmm. or fight, yeah. freeze, fight, or flight. Like there's yeah. the three options you have right. when you, when you let the fear get, get right. too, too much. And I think it speaks to the importance of like, when you we will get a little less serious from parenting, but like, you know, when you, when you embark on a new journey to like exercise more or, you know, eat healthier, that kind of stuff, you're probably not going the, the route you take to be successful is probably going to look different than the one you think you're going to go when you start, right? Things are going to have mm -hmm. to change. Things are going to be different. Some mm -hmm. things that you think are going to work out don't. Um, some things that you thought would be a waste of time really become important. Like <clears throat> you, we have to be, man, we, I know we speak about this all the time, but there's just, you have to be flexible with it. You know, you have to be able to go like, okay, I'm starting, here we go. And really be willing to go, but at any moment, I'm going to let some things go. I'm going to pick up some things that I didn't even know were there, right? Like I'm going to be willing to be flexible and adapt and change. Um, because otherwise, like you're saying, Aaron, if we, if the only way is the way we've initially pictured and it's not working out, <laughs> then yeah. what are our options? And this is the way we go about it a lot. And so the only other option is either that or nothing. Well, guess what? Nothing. And yeah. that's why people go through these cycles, you know, over and over and over of attempt and stop attempt and stop attempt and stop. Mm -hmm. And to your point, the unknown is another really common fear. And, and I would say this one, we're going to talk about the fear of success too, because mm -hmm. that, that for me at least was a little more of a complicated 
sort of concept to grasp because I had never really experienced that before. I have a story to illustrate that, but um, fear of failure, fear of success. I think the unknown is probably behind a lot of it as well. So maybe you have this vision of how it's going to, you know, turn out and maybe what you want to get out of this experience. You know, I'm going to devote my, my attention to, I don't know, prepping food and, and planning ahead for the week. And this is how it's going to look and blah, blah, blah. The unknowns, I mean, there could be a whole host of them that mm-hmm. pop up during this endeavor that you, <laughs> yeah. And what are those unknowns? You know, one way you can try and combat that is to just really start illustrating all of the possibilities, go through every possibility in your head that you can think of, or sit down with a friend, or if you, you know, are in therapy, or if you have someone to talk to that can a coach or somebody that can help you kind of delve into some of those other possibilities, because even if you identify a negative outcome or something that you don't want to happen, it's no longer an unknown you can actually look at it and prepare for it. Mm -hmm. So it, it will maybe take some of that fear away. If you really just open your mind to what are some of these unknowns that scare me? Because there Mm -hmm. could be unknown, great things along the way. And then there could be unknown challenges along the way. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's a great, I think that's a great point. And I think too, I think, you know, something I've used with clients before too, is just ask yourself like, so let's, let's use meal prep since you brought it up as an example, you know, if, if their plan is to, you know, on the weekend, you know, we have kind of a menu prepared and there's meal prepping to do and that kind of stuff. So they're set up for success. And what if you don't get it done? Like, let's go down that road. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't like people to get caught up in what ifs, but let's say worst case scenario, you don't do any of it. What happens? And think through that. Okay. So let's say I don't get any of this prepped can my week still be successful? Or even if it's not super successful, well, worst case scenario, okay, I can do it the next weekend. And I have, you know, maybe a few days where, you know, maybe they aren't as veggie heavy as I thought, or they're a little more hectic, or maybe I stop and grab fast food a few times. And then the next weekend, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And is that as terrible as we think it's going to be because I think what we do with that expectation or fear of failing is it's, it's either we do it or everything explodes. Right. (laughs) Like the world is ending. Yes. yes. (laughs) Like we give it so much power, you know, as opposed to like, just looking at it realistically, like what if, what if you don't get to the gym this week? What what does that mean? Nobody's going to die. Like, (laughs) right. Like, okay. So what? You know, right. and I think some things like that, some strategies like that kind of kind of take away some of that, that fear of failure. And I think the reason we fear failure is because kind of like you mentioned, like we, we just, we magnify it, right? If a failure is going to be attempt ending, right? Like if I miss something, then this whole thing has been pointless and screw it. I'll wait for January 1st of next year, mm-hmm. you know, and that's kind of how we approach this a lot. Versus looking at a little more realistically and going like, okay, so if we inevitably, when you do fail, like, so what? Right. Shrug it off and keep going. And that's important for everybody to remember that failure is, I mean, it, I guess it depends on how you define failure sure. because I don't want to say failure is inevitable. I think that maybe falling short of a goal or for outcomes to not be what you expected. Things not going the way you planned. Yep. If you define that as failure, then that is going to be part of life. So Mm -hmm. just get, get on board with it and learn how to cope and manage it and, and, uh, roll with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but also look at those kinds of things as learning. Um, I remember I, when I learned to skate ski years ago, I think the first time I took lessons was in like 2012 or something. And anybody who has learned to skate ski will appreciate that it's very technique intensive. All Nordic skiing is, mm-hmm. and it's a continual process. I mean, I've been skiing for eight years now and I'm still learning. And I would get really embarrassed when I'd fall. And I mean, I still fall. I fell a week ago when I went Mm -hmm. for the first time this year. And, you know, I've, I mean, I've pretty seasoned skate skier by now, 
But I remember one of, uh, one of the guys in our local Nordic group that was kind of up there helping and like giving some, I mean, just one of the, I call them the old charge, you know, these guys that have been yeah. skate skiing their whole lives. And, <laughs> and I kept falling and I was getting, he could tell I was getting really frustrated and kind of embarrassed. And like, you know, I was making like self deprecating jokes and whatever. Mm -hmm. And he goes, if you're not falling over at least once in a while, you're not learning. And he was describing how your muscles have to learn because you're supposed to balance on that ski, your muscles and your brain and your proprioception all has to learn where that limit is. Right. And if you're not learning where that limit is by sometimes you're going to step over the line. And that means you fall over on your mm -hmm. skis in front of everybody when nobody else is falling over. Right. And whatever, <laughs> you know, you laugh at yourself and you're done. But yeah. that that's just an example of, you know, that learning process and mm -hmm. to remind yourself that without those shortcomings or without falling short of the goal or, you know, maybe having a different outcome without that failure, we're not going to grow and learn. And you could always just stay in this really nice little comfort zone if you, mm -hmm. if you want. And some people do, and some people really have identified within themselves that they have very limited capacity for risk, um, for that fear. Some people have huge capacity for it. Like they'll, mm -hmm. you know, sign up for an Ironman when they don't even know how to swim. Like my husband did. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of different ways to approach that, that goal or that thing you're going after and know yourself and, you know, maybe talk to yourself about what, what does this look like? If I fail, how am I going to cope with that? Mm -hmm. Um, what's my capacity for, for the learning that is needed for me to reach this goal? Right. When I was a kid, so probably like, I would say six, seven, eight years old, somewhere in there. Um, my parents had these tapes, these cassette tapes um, from a like comedian speaker kind of guy. His name was Bob Moad, Bob Moad. And he was kind of like a comedian. He was funny, but he also had like kind of these life lessons, right? And his big thing was stinking thinking. He talked about stinking <laughs> thinking, telling ourselves can't, I can't, right? And so I would fall asleep. There was a period of time in my life where I fell asleep, listened to these like a bunch. And in, in one of these tapes, um, he would say, anything worth doing is worth doing badly for a while. Mm. Right. So kind of just to piggyback on your point that anything new you want to do, if it's, if it's worth doing, then you really need to be prepared and honestly eager to do it poorly for a little while, you know? So I, I relate that to when I, I've been playing the guitar since I was like 14. So it's 26 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty good now. I've been playing for a long time. I've played a lot, you know, um, when I first started, I was as terrible as anybody, right? Because that's how it is when you first start something. But I knew I really, really, really want to play guitar. Like this is important to me learning this, mastering this is something that I really, really want to do. And it's going to be worthwhile. And so there were times for me where I, I was frustrated. I was pissed off. I wanted to break my guitar too, you know, <laughs> I mean, just maddening. But at the same time, I had sort of this underlying current of like, but just keep going because you're going to get it right. Like you screwed it up. Okay. Screw it up again and screw it up again until you screw it up less, you know, mm -hmm. and then you'll screw it up even less. And then you're going to be like, oh, I'm kind of getting it. And now I can do it kind of okay. You know, because I just, I knew that this was something worthwhile to me. And so it was worth it to do it poorly for a little bit. Yeah. Because anytime we're learning a new skill or habit or anything like, like it's, it's not going to come easy. It's, it's not, it's going to be a fight and you're probably going to do it poorly for a bit. And that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. That means you're learning how to do it. Yeah. And I mean, think about if you had let the fear of failure or the frustration get the best of you, mm -hmm. you may have given up on it or yeah. not even tried it all. I'll never be able to play the, I'll never get this right. I can't mm -hmm. play the guitar kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, or you might shy away from the goal. Well, instead of learning to play, you know, this 
chord or, or this song, I'm just gonna, you know, maybe strum a little bit once in a while and kind of, you know, so, so not like really committing to the mm-hmm. process of like, I'm going to give it my best effort. Right. And, you know, sometimes we think of, um, you know, something like playing the guitar, you have to strum and screw up and fumble so many times before oh, yeah. you really get it right. Yeah. And I think sometimes with like, let's take a fitness goal or something that someone has, they'll kind of set in their mind that, okay, so I'm going to, you know, train for a 10 K or something. Mm-hmm. And this is a big goal and I'm going to, you know, go through the process. I'm going to do the training and you do your very, very best. And you have like this time goal in mind that you're going to hit and you think you've got it all figured out. And then you race and you complete the race. You completed the training. You set yourself up as best as you could. And it didn't pan out the way you wanted it to, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe you had a certain time or finishing placement you were after, Sometimes the process is not like just in this one big goal, but it's like, okay, try another 10 K try another one, try another one. And it's like years and years and years of repetition and just going through the experiences numerous times Mm -hmm. before you really nail it. And I, I think, you know, athletics is a really great example of this, but business is also a great example. I have a friend who, you know, was an entrepreneur. He'd start up companies and he went bankrupt three times before he sold his company for 11 million. So it took so much repetition and failure really. I mean, going bankrupt, I think a lot of people would probably chalk that up to, to failing, but, you know, realizing that even some of those really big goals and failures can be part of the process of continuing to learn and and go at it again. Right. And I think it's, there's a, there's a big shift of mentality that needs to happen. And and we've talked about this before. It's the, you know, the behaviors versus the outcome. Right. And we, we look at the outcome, like for me, like I want to be able to play the guitar like a maniac, right? Like I want to play it well. (laughs) And if that's all that matters, then I'm probably not going to get there because the, the process has no value. It's just in the way of the goal. So if your, if your goal is to, you know, lose X amount of pounds or have this fitness goal or, you know, get off some cholesterol medication, you know, whatever it is, if, if that's all that matters, well, guess what? You don't get to get there until you go through the process to get there. And and the process, it, it, it teaches us all the things we need to know. We need to learn the skills and tools we need to have to get to where we want to go, you know? And so that, I mean, failure, it's, it's really just, it's the process showing us what we don't know yet that mm-hmm. we need to know to continue to move forward. And we, we give it such and I'm guilty of this myself, like even today. Oh, yeah, so, we yeah. all are. I'm not saying that I don't struggle with this anymore by any means, but all failure is, is it's just a process going, hey, here's a thing you don't know yet that you need to know to move further. So let's work at this until we figure out how to do it. Because you can't skip this. If you skip this, then you don't have, you know, you don't have the foundation to learn the next things. And, and so failure isn't like, we, we just treat it like such a, this magnificent event that brings everything to a halt. And it's like, if that's how you treat failure, guess what? You're never going to do anything new. You're never going to get anywhere, but where you are now, because you've got to learn these things. You have to learn these lessons or these skills or habits, whatever to move on. And that's all failure is. It's just the process going, Hey, we need to figure this one out. You know, can we all just appreciate how friendly Michael's failure voice is? <laughs> hey, this is something you don't know. That's all. Okay, well, time to move forward. <laughs> but that's how it should be, right? Not like, uh, totally. hey, idiot. Well, Guess what? You screwed up again, just like you always do. But that's the voice most of us have. That's what happens, <laughs> isn't it? So that's yeah. another thing, you know, we talked about Everyone's in our journaling. at you. Oh yeah. We talked about in our journaling episode, how to try and like shift your, what your brain is telling you into a more positive, like reframing things and putting Mm -hmm. some affirmations out there so that you're actually believing 
you know, the more positive things because our brain is programmed to Mm -hmm. seek out the negative things and to focus on those things and to stir them up in our brains and, and, you know, keep reminding us how sucky we are Mm -hmm. and how much we failed. Yeah. So if you could just, I mean, call it a little bit of grace, call Mm -hmm. it talking to yourself in a friendly way. I mean, I, I work with clients on that a lot when they're really hard on themselves. And I'll be like, would you say that to a really good friend? What would you say to a friend who's in the same position, you know, or a loved one or something? What would they say to you? Maybe Mm -hmm. might be another way to look at it. And you can, when you, when you get into that fear of failing, oftentimes that negative Nancy in your head is going to take over and things are just going to be you're never going to get this right. Or this is not worth it. I'm not worth it. Why do I even try? Here I go again, failing again. You know, if try and catch yourself thinking those things and going into that headspace because, Mm. and then listen to Michael's friendly failure voice again. (laughs) Hey, (laughs) Hey, look, it's something for us to learn. You get to do a new thing now. (laughs) Exactly. See, nice and cheerful and friendly, non-threatening, you know, so just just a little buddy (laughs) and it'll, it'll help you move beyond that fear. So you don't get stuck in that freeze Mm -hmm. flight or, or fight response. Well, and it's just, you know, you're just, you're echoing kind of, I don't remember what episode this was, but the whole rewriting the script thing, Mm. you know, and I think, I think that's a big part of that fear of failure is I've done this before and I know what happens and I know what's going to happen again, right? Yeah. Like, like I have, I can see the whole path laid out for me based on what I've done in the past, you know? And so there's that script that we just, you know, we just kind of hit play and okay, I, here I go, I'm making an attempt again, but I know how this is going to go. And as soon as, you know, I quote unquote fail and I don't meet my goals one day or whatever, then, okay, you know, autopilot, well, this is what I do all the time. And I always screw this up and it's because, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and we just kind of fall into that just autoplay. We fall into that script that we know way too well. And I think if we're going to avoid that, you know, we've talked about this before, but if we're going to avoid that, we have to make conscious effort to do something different, Mm -hmm. you know, like there's gotta be some real mindfulness and real awareness to how have we done things in the past and how are we going to combat those things when they do come up? Cause they're going to come up. They will. Right? We've developed a script through years and years and years of experience. We know it inside and out. So when it does come up, how are we going to handle that? You know, and that's something I, I point out to clients like, Hey, this is a moment right here. What you're telling yourself, this is what you've told me. You've told yourself all the time in the past. So what do we do different? How, okay. Right now, let's scratch out those lines. And what are you going to write instead? Mm-hmm. You know, what's, what's a different act of this play rather than what you've done before? How are we going to do that? And let's start, let's talk through that. And honestly, I think that in and of itself can be a really good um, starting place to, to go somewhere different is let's just, let's talk through that. What yeah. are you, what are the actual actions you're going to take right now to do something different? What are the things you're going to tell yourself right now? So you're not telling yourself those old things that just dig deeper wounds. You know, how are we going to go forward in a new way? I also think it's important to name the fear for what it is and acknowledge that I'm really scared of this. Like I I was having a conversation with Matt last week about, you know, I'm, I'm nine months into really giving my business um, the attention that it needs to grow and to be my full-time you know, gig. And I was talking about the pros and cons of considering, you know, going back into like the standardized workforce, you know, the nine to five, whatever. And he was like, well, would you be doing it just for like the money or the stability, the benefits? Like what, what are the reasons? (laughs) And very honestly, I just said, well, it would save me the experience of possibly falling on my face (laughs) as an entrepreneur. (laughs) And he kind of looked at me like, that's not like, I mean, he's, he's wonderful and was just like, well, that's not even, you know, in the realm of my imagination, but okay, you could fail. And this would save you from, from that. And so I think as soon as the words came out of my mouth and I kind of was laughing as I was saying it, because I was like, this is total truth. This is exactly what I'm thinking. Okay. So let's name that fear and acknowledge it. And 
you know, like you were saying earlier, sort of embrace it and be like, well, a healthy dose of fear is not a bad thing and it can hold one accountable and it can, you know, I know that I'm doing something important and healthy for me, you know, both from a, you know, personal growth standpoint, but also a professional standpoint, if I have a little bit of fear, you know, around this, then acknowledge it and name it and be clear that yes, that's fear at work whenever I'm, you know, having these like apprehensions, but it doesn't mean that I have to just stop what I'm doing and, you know, abort mission and like go, go in a different direction. Right. Well, and I think the more we do it, the easier it gets, you know, I, you know, I used to work, um, in a psychiatric hospital here in Houston and they had, um, an OCD unit and obsessive compulsive disorder unit. And they would do regularly what was called exposure therapy. So let's mm-hmm. say, let's say someone, you know, had a real fear of, um, having their hands dirty and they come, you know, compulsively wash their hands. And some of these people's hands would be just like red and raw. They washed them so much because they were just terrified that there was something on them that's going to get them sick. And so part of their exposure therapy would be, let's go get your hands dirty. And then you get to sit with it. You don't get to wash your hands, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you get to just sit with this. Oh my God, <laughs> like this is the worst thing ever. And, and I think that that kind of, it plays into how we begin to look at failure differently and, and deal with our fear of failure a little bit differently. We, if we can do it in small bites, if we can do it in, in small ways, we sort of begin to, and then realize, oh, okay, I'm okay, right? Like I, I, I faced this fear and I survived or I quote unquote failed and I'm still on this journey moving forward, right? Then I can handle it in a little bit bigger ways. Maybe I can look at some bigger fears or some bigger failures and mm-hmm. handle those okay. It just, I think we can, begin to build up our resiliency towards those things. And I think resiliency is something that a lot of us, I don't know, don't have in regards to this. We need to practice it a little more because we don't, we don't do these things long enough to build up resiliency. We go through it long enough to the place where we meet something hard and we go, Oh, no, I'm out to to realize Uh, we don't like feeling that way. I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously I'm doing something wrong because there was a challenge here, right? It wasn't easy. And as soon as things got hard, well, I'm screwing this up, you know? Um, and so I don't think we give ourselves a chance to build up this internal resiliency and this confidence in ourselves. But if we can do that in kind of some small ways, you know, face that fear of failure and face those failures and just move right past them, we can take on bigger ones. Yeah. How do you think all of this applies to fear of success? Have you run into that with oh, yeah. clients or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that to me, I think the fear of success, uh, at least a big part of it, I would say for a lot of people is that script, right? Mm-hmm. Because as much as that script that we have and we follow can work against us, it's familiar and we know it and we know what to expect and we know how it goes, right? Like we know the whole play. I know it inside and out. I've done it so many times. And I, it's, there's, there's a real comfort in knowing what to expect and knowing these things inside out. I think it's the same thing with, with people's habits that actively work against them. You know, they can see that, but they also know I just, it's, it's easier. It's more mm-hmm. comfortable. Even if it's painful, there's, there's a comfort there because we just know them inside and out. And I think a lot of people have to ask themselves the question, if I'm successful here, then who am I? Cause I don't know how to operate in that. Mm-hmm. Like where I'm at may suck and be painful, but I know it and I'm comfortable with it. And I, I know how to get through my days, you know, but if I'm someone who lets go of that and now I'm successful, I have to identify as something new. You know, I have to see myself as a new person because I'm doing new things. And I think that leaving what is comfortable and what is known, even if it's unhealthy, I think is what keeps a lot of people from really giving this an honest attempt is because I just, I don't know. It's that unknown that you were talking about. I don't know what that is. I don't know a me who does these things, who has these habits. I don't know a me who invests in themselves and really takes a high 
you know, it really takes um, good care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And how about you? You run into that a lot? Well, so my fear of success story was um, something, again, I shared earlier in the podcast that it was kind of a different concept for me the first time it was introduced that fear of success, because I, I always just had these kind of rose colored glasses. that was like, well, of course you want to succeed. Of course you want to set goals and go for them. And, you know, not, I mean, I had like failed or fallen short numerous times, but I just kind of had this, like, I'll try again. And I remember it was, so the first time this concept was introduced to me in racing, was, um, probably, I think it was like my second kind of, you know, I'd say I, I was getting into it before I turned pro my second season, really racing triathlon and my, my first ever coach, um, I was on my way to the world champion 70.3 world championships as an age grouper. And we were having kind of our pre race, you know, shakedown Mm -hmm. talk. And he, you know, we're talking about the contingencies. Like if this happens, what am I going to do and strategizing? And he said, so let me ask you this are you prepared to win? And I was like, well, I'm not going to win. And he goes, well, but are you prepared for that to win? And I just was like, I'm not really sure what he's getting at. Like, it's kind of, I, I, I mean, it just kind of went, vroom, you know, sure. right by me. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm yeah, prepared duh. to do well. <laughs> I'm prepared to like race the hell out of this and like enjoy the experience and win. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm prepared. It wasn't until I think five years later when I was now I've been racing pro for, you know, I don't know, three or four seasons. And I was, I was at a race where I had a good chance of winning. I knew the winner of this race previous years. She had won it, I think four or five years in a row very respectable athlete. She knows this course inside out. It's her, basically her home turf, like all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten second to her before. And so it was this feeling of like, I know I've got a really good chance of winning this. So I went into the race fully knowing that I was just going to be on the hunt all day because I knew she Mm -hmm. was going to probably be ahead of me by the time we got on the run, but that was going to be my, you know, my ace in the hole. So we get going on the run course and um, my husband's out there and it's playing out, you know, pretty much how I had envisioned as far as like how far down I am and she's in front of me and, you know, and my husband's out there giving me splits and I, a few other people are giving me splits, meaning telling me how far down I am from her. Sure. And I think by mile, like five or six, I was literally within like 20 seconds of her Wow. and I came around this corner and there she was. And I'm like, I mean, she's right there. I can mm. pass her. And I'm about halfway through the run. Cause it's a 13 mile run. And I was like, there she, like, I had this spark of like, holy crap, this is mm-hmm. going to happen. I'm going to win my first big pro race, like for me. And I like was just ready. Like, yeah, let's do this. And I got right onto her heels and I'm not kidding you. I had this sudden like, I don't even know what to, how to describe it, but like this visceral kind of implosion of, I can't do this. This isn't, I, I don't know. Oh my gosh. What if I can't, what if I like, it was instantaneous. It was just like my brain suddenly went into this. It was probably a fight or flight response. And it was just like, what, what do I do now? Like, I'm going to pass her. And then what if I, what if I like fall apart? What if I get a cramp? What if my ankle gives out? What if I, you know, just implode and Mm -hmm. I don't have the nutrition right. And like all of these thousand what ifs came at me at once. And I was just running behind her on her shoulder, like we're just following along. And I was like, I can't, I, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. And it lasted just a few seconds. I know it sounds like it lasted minutes (laughs) long, but it was just like this really bizarre instantaneous Mm -hmm. effect on me. And then I passed her. And I remember in that moment, just deciding, like, I have to give that this is what I've been training for and waiting for and preparing myself for. And I have to give it everything I have and honor this moment and to hell with any of those, those fears, those things that just hit me so rapidly. And I passed her, I did go on to win the race. Um, 
nice. man, she had me, she had me running scared the whole time. <laughs> um, and it was really fun to, you know, to talk with her after the race because she, I mean, we're friends and, um, you know, she was very complimentary and, and we were, you know, talking about how that moment kind of played out. And it didn't hit me until later. I had some time to just mentally kind of process that and be like, whoa, what the hell even happened? <laughs> like, right. where did that even come from? And I remember that conversation with my coach years ago. And now I know why he asked, are you prepared to win? Because it really was this bizarre. I don't, I don't know if it was, that was my comfort zone was coming in second or third, you know, like I've never really been the winner. And so I don't know what to do. The pressure of right. all the, what ifs, yeah. like, what if this doesn't play out the way I'm in this moment? Like, would it look better if I just like hung on her shoulder this entire way and then sprinted out at the finish and then whatever, and take mm -hmm. my chances. I mean, just all of these things hit me so instantaneously, yeah. but I had, I, that was my my, I would say my first real lesson and probably the most profound one of my life of that fear of winning or that fear of success and how powerful that can be and how unexpected and yeah. irrational that can be. Yeah. That's a good story. <laughs> so what was it like for you? So let's, you, you had this big success, right? Your first big pro win, your immediate response when this might happen was all these fears. So how was it like beyond that? Like, how was it, what was it like adopting that new identity of, oh, I'm a pro race winner now. This is, <laughs> this is something I do. And did that, how did that relate into future attempts? Was there, was there, you know, fear of like, is this the only time I do it? Am I like a one hit wonder, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> Do I just, how did that play out in the future? Yeah, I think, I think all of that is true. You know, you, one of the hardest things I think about a big win or a breakthrough performance, whether no matter your placing, if you like had a breakthrough performance, one of the hardest things is really soaking in that joy and carrying that forward in a positive way, instead of suddenly being like, oh, well, crap, am I going to be able to repeat that? Is that just a fluke? What am I, if I don't repeat it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, so it's this very intense kind of push and pull, I guess, in sure. your, in your brain, sure. which is why I do think it's really important to celebrate even the smallest accomplishments. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I focused on moving forward was, okay, I have that experience. You know, what did it teach me? I confronted my fear in this moment. And it really was just like, I mean, a few strides, you know, we're talking mm -hmm. like, you know, a couple hundred meters that I was running with her before I kicked it in and decided like, I have a choice here. Like, this is what I'm going to decide to do. Mm -hmm. And I carried that forth with me, no matter what my, my, you know, competition was like, I mean, I was in a lot of races that had much deeper fields and racing against Olympians and world champions and some right. really big names. And in those races, like I, I knew my chances of winning are like pretty <laughs> damn slim just from yeah. a physiological scientific fact, you know, <laughs> but you can carry forth the same kind of mental lessons and that same confidence and, and energy of knowing that this is how I deal with those moments. And this mm -hmm. is how, you know, I can overcome all of those things along the way, whatever crops up, whatever fear or, you know, hiccup crops up in the day. It gave me a lot of, um, confidence moving forward in those races. Sure. I can see that. Well, you know, I think too, like when we're successful, we get to, we get to understand ourselves better. We get to know ourselves better. And I think, I think a lot of people's, I'm going to say a lot of people, I don't have statistics. I'm just going to say a lot of people. Okay. I think this is my opinion. A lot of people's unhappiness with life comes from just like not in any way living up to any kind of potential, mm -hmm. right? Like there's, they haven't even explored. What am I really capable of? It's there's this kind of circle of comfort and this is what I know and this is what I do. And then I just do this until I die. You know, it's like, I just live within this little framework 
And, and I think people, when they find themselves doing that, they, they just never really get to experience what they're capable of and to live in a way that's not fulfilling your potential, whatever that is. I think it's a hard way to live. You know, I think it's a very unsatisfying way to go through life. And, and I get fear of success and I get fear of failure, but once you begin to see that, Hey, facing these things kind of head on, it leads me to a place where I know myself better. I understand myself better. I understand the world better and how to relate to it. And I am living with, you know, um, living out more of my potential. It's like, you know, evolving, you know, it's like going through an evolution. Like I'm a new thing now and I live in new and more powerful ways. And when people never get to experience that, it just, it, man, it just really breaks my heart, you know, yeah. because I think a lot of us, I mean, I feel like I've been through a lot of, I don't feel like I've reached my potential yet. You know, I feel mm -hmm. like I've found a lot of new places of my potential you know, but man, I, I feel like there's a lot more out there for me to get to discover, you know, and I'm excited to do that. And, but I just, I just think so often we just confine ourselves and we just say, well, this is it for me, you know, and, and that's in a bunch of ways outside of health and fitness and, you know, yeah. exercise, like in a lot of things, but I just, there's so, so much more out there for most people, I think. And we, they, they're never going to see it because it's just like, mm -mm, mm -hmm. I don't think I can do that. I can't yeah. face that, that failure or that success. And for, for some people, you know, it opens doors to more unknowns mm -hmm. and possibilities mm -hmm. that that success or that failure, yeah. you know, well, then what you start playing the, then what game. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember working with a client who, you know, of course we were working on healthy eating, weight loss and exercise, and there was some self-sabotaging going on as we worked together. And I started kind of pulling it out and, and asking about, well, you know, here are some of the things I'm hearing come from you. Like, where's this coming from? And it finally came out that, well, if I don't lose the weight, then there's always this thing that I have to work on before I start dating again. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh boy, that then we just went into a totally yeah. different territory that we hadn't talked about before. And it showed me that man, she's afraid of succeeding mm -hmm. at this fitness and, and nutrition thing because it opens a door, a possible door to a whole area of life that she's just not ready for. Um, and of course that would be one of those situations where I, you know, maybe we talk about, is there a therapist that can help you with some mm -hmm. of those things and, you know, working through those things, because if that's what's standing between you and being physically healthy, right. then that needs to be addressed and that needs to be worked on. And, right. and it could be just the way it's built up in your mind, you know, mm -hmm. like if I succeed and then this thing happens and then this yeah. thing happens and you start kind of creating this, you know, imaginary domino effect right. in your brain. So, yeah. Well, that's a good point. I, you know, and, and I, I think there are probably a lot of times very valid, deep seated reasons for not facing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I don't in any way mean to gloss over that as like, well, you're not reaching your potential. So suck it up and do it, you know, <laughs> um, by any means, you know, what you were just saying it just to get heavy here for a minute. Um, it made me think of a client I, I had years and years and years ago and you know, she, um, she wanted to lose about 70, 80 pounds. Um, but we kept coming to these like kind of roadblocks. And for me, I was just like, I don't understand what's happening here. Like why, what's mm -hmm. going on. And one day at the end of a workout that was particularly tough, she was just kind of gassed. The tears just started to come. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Ooh, what? you okay? Like what's going on? You know? And she just told me that when she was much, much younger, she had been raped and her physiological response to that was if I get heavy and stay heavy, I feel like I'm protected. I feel mm -hmm. like maybe that will never happen again. hundred percent makes sense. Right. And there's a lot 
to unpack, to be able to um, really give this a solid go. You know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a lot behind there that that would have to be addressed before. Hey, let's face some failure and you know look at right. being successful. But even though there was all that, working through that, moving beyond that, like that's not a healthy place to stay, right? Like like okay, if I if I keep this weight on, then I'm safe. Like that's not that's not processing through that. That's not mm-hmm. living um, beyond this. Right. And I, 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 I don't mean to minimize this in any way. And I, I, you know, yeah, but, but staying there still is not a healthy place, you know? So even if there's very incredibly understandable reasons for why facing this stuff, um, is challenging for you, I think it's still worthwhile to do the work so that you can because living in those places, I don't think is very healthy, you know, living in those Mm -hmm. places that there's not freedom there, you know, that is a, that's kind of a a prison, you know? And so if, if I've in any way to anyone listening made it seem like, you know, glossing over some of the stuff um, or that it's easier than it is really is for a lot of people, I, I understand. And I'm not saying that, but I am saying that still living there is not a healthy place to stay and doing the work to move beyond that is, is really worthwhile. Yeah, no, I think you made that point. And I think the, you know, the, the entire thing we're kind of addressing here with this fear, living in fear does not serve anyone in, in any capacity. And of course, as I said before, there's a lot of different levels of that where some people are really comfortable with discomfort and high risk Mm -hmm. and like lots of fear, like let's jump out of a plane kind of fear. And other people are like, "Mm, I'm very comfortable with, let's start with 10 minutes of walking around my neighborhood that I know before I actually go to a gym and start exercise. So there's all kinds of, there's a whole spectrum of ways to approach this. I think probably the, the best message we can provide anybody today is first of all, you know, understanding that fear is a very strong motivator or demotivator in some instances and to identify and name it and don't, Mm -hmm. don't be afraid of the fear, you know, like don't, don't be ashamed of it or anything. We all have it. It's very normal and natural human emotion and, and, you know, state, um, know that there are tools out there to help Mm -hmm. you move beyond the fear, maneuver around it, to cope with the fear. Um, you know, we talked about a few, whether it's just changing, you know, entertaining a lot of different possibilities so that there aren't any unknowns, maybe changing the way you look at it instead of that negative, you know, a spiral of just, BS that goes on in your head, you know, start shifting that into more positive affirmations Mm -hmm. and talking to yourself in a, in a more positive tone, focus on the things you can control, you know, what are the things you can control? Um, and, and if there is a, you know, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this podcast, there is actually a term for, um, an irrational fear of failure. So there's a phobia. You say this. A tickophobia. Oh, that was easier. I thought it was going to be a tickophobia. I know it's spelled right. really, really Oops, intimidating, right. but I'm so smart. It's not how so. I would say it. <laughs> <laughs> I could have like 10 tries. I would have got there. <laughs> a tickophobia. So there, I mean, I guess to say that there, there is some clinical manifestations of this mm-hmm. kind of thing. So if that is you, then know that there is help out there. Find a good therapist, you know, mm-hmm. talk to a, you know, healthcare provider or somebody, um, if you find that there are, especially if you've gone through an experience, you know, like Michael just talked about, then I think, I think it's important to acknowledge just first of all, acknowledge that that is the thing that's standing in your way. And then, you know, kind of take some of that power away so you can address it. Right. Yeah. So what do you think are some good ways to begin to do that? Like to, what are some practical ways to begin to overcome that fear of failure and kind of look at that head on and Mm -hmm. charge into the darkness a little bit? (laughs) I think, 
because some of our most powerful learning tools come from experiences Mm -hmm. and the way we see situations are often framed by experiences. So I would probably go through and start just like that, you know, race experience that Mm I um, detailed. I would probably think back to times when I have successfully encountered whatever kind of situation and I overcame it and, mm-hmm. or it turned out, you know, differently than I expected, but was it all bad? And what did I learn from that? And so mm-hmm. I, I would probably start analyzing and thinking about some of those things. Um, I think it is really helpful to think about the things you can control. So when, when I was racing, it was, I can control the effort I put out in this workout. Mm -hmm. I can control to some extent, my schedule, my sleep, um, how I spend my time. So if Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, able to rest enough, or if I'm running around doing social things, I can control if my bike is fully like tuned and ready to go on race day. And I've triple checked everything. You know, there are certain things that I could control that helped set me up for success. And those things provide a lot of calming and confidence going forward. So similarly, you can control putting your gym clothes in the bag the night before. So your bag is ready to grab on your way out the door to work. So you can go Mm -hmm. work out after work. You know, you can control when you do your grocery shopping and getting the right items for you and setting the time aside to prep meals or, or to cook with your spouse or whatever. So there's think of the things you can control and really get specific and make them very small things because Mm -hmm. those very small things are a lot easier to execute than the very big overwhelming things. So if you, if you start, you know, shifting things into very small doable goals that, you know, you can control, or you have at least more control over. I think that can really help. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And I think that's one of the the things I do the most often with clients is those small goals. You know, um, it's really important that you give yourself proof that you can do this, especially if you have a history of quote unquote, a bunch of failures, you know, it's really important that you build confidence in yourself and your ability to, um, you know, be consistent with goals to do these things. Well, give yourself some, some proof and some momentum and, and where people often go wrong with that is like, you know, we've talked about, I'm going to do all the things, you know, I'm going to eat, you know, 17 vegetables in a day and drink 140 ounces of water and get eight hours of sleep and exercise for 10 hours. And, you know, just all these things. And, 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 one of them on their own is way too big. But if you, if you start, if you start small and you start at a place that you know is this is doable, like I know I can do this this week, whatever that is. And you give yourself proof that you can do this. It's easier to take on another thing because you're coming from a place, you're coming from a path of success. Right. Um, And so it's like, Hey, I did that. I feel good about this. You know, I have momentum. I am happy. I've been consistent. Like I'm proving to myself, I can do this. It's easier to adopt some other small things versus Mm -hmm. taking on way too much. And then you just tend to people often reinforce this false belief that I'm just not cut out for this. See, I did it again. It's that script again, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. I failed just like I always do. And this is me. And I just don't think I'm cut out to be a healthier person or to, you know, whatever it is that someone's wanting to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good stuff. Do you have any other Uh, things to talk about? Yeah. So um, let us know what you guys think of this topic. If you have any stories to share, Um, you know, I'm always fascinated to hear the, I love, especially like a good underdog story. Um, but you know, we're all underdogs (laughs) at some point in our lives. So I love hearing those, those stories I think are really inspirational. And, um, I learn something every time I hear one of those experiences from, from a client and especially if it's relatable. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Stories of of, of how you've faced those fears or how you've ever overcome a failure or how you've confidently moved into a place of success. Love to hear those. Yeah. 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 So do you have a meeting in the mundane this week? 
You know what I did? And I lost it. I should have written it down because I actually had one and I can't think of it now. <laughs> well, I can go first and maybe it'll come to ah, you. That, okay. that happens sometimes. Yeah, it does. Mine was mm-hmm. on Friday night. Uh, Matt had his um, office kind of Christmas lunch just with the people he works with there at the studio. And mm-hmm. so by the time he came home, he had already gone through his his decompression phase. So he often needs to, you know, I'm home by myself most of the day. And so I, you know, am pretty happy to have another human in the house to talk to. And it was a total role reversal because I was like super busy on Friday. And so by the time he got home from work, I was still at my desk, like ticking away on the computer and trying to wrap up a few things. And I was just Mm -hmm. like, go, go away. Like, I can't talk. I can't focus on you and I can't entertain any conversation right now. And he, on the other hand was like, yeah, you know, (laughs) wanting to tell me about his day and wanting to bring me a chocolate and all this other stuff. And I was like, ah, (sighs) So we ended up, once I finished up work, we went over and, you know, ate dinner at the table and just had a really nice conversation about our days and about, that's when he shared with me that funny Instagram reel that was like full of a lot of swear words (laughs) and was just so funny that I, I was like, where'd you find this? But it was that moment and we're by the Christmas tree and he was just in a really good mood and he was I mean, I'm sure that they had like a margarita or something. Okay. So I'm not, (laughs) I'm sure he had a little help in being in such a great mood, but it was just fun to have such an ordinary Friday night. You know, we're not lamenting about, oh, we can't go out to, you know, have a drink because of COVID and we're not planning any holiday traveling because of COVID. And, Mm -hmm. you know, all of those things that tend to like have a dark cloud over Mm -hmm. life these days. Mm -hmm. Um, it was completely absent and it was just like a fun, I, I just enjoy his company so much and we get along so well and we laugh together and it was just one of those ordinary Friday night dinner kind of moments where I'm just like, this is, this is the guy for me. And this is such a wonderful little life that we have. And this is a great little moment and I love laughing with you. So yeah, it was, uh, one of those, just nothing real special about it, but man, it's, that's what life's about. You know, there was a lot of meaning in the mundane. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. I like that. Awesome. So I remembered mine. Um, B it's like magic. That's like I magic. Think. You know how many uh, times I've done that for you? A lot. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> one for doing that and two for, you know, letting everybody know. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, no, so about roughly about two weeks ago, our dryer just all of a sudden stopped working. And I was like, crap, it's like 20 years old. You know, it's like a tank, um, but it's, it's worked well for a long time. And just one day it just stopped working. And I am not the handiest guy around. Like I'm not <laughs> Mr. Fix it. Right. And it's something that I, I wish I was better at. I'm just not, I'm just not real good at that stuff. I never did a lot of it growing up or anything. So, um, but anyway, so I kind of like researched about, you know, like, well, not researched. I looked up, you know, like, um, what might be going on? How can you fix it? And I felt like I kind of identified the problem. So I ordered the part and it took like, I don't know, over a week to get here. And it finally came, Saturday. I think it came on Saturday, a few days ago. And I got the dryer taken apart, got it replaced, plugged it in, turned it on and it worked. And I was so proud of myself. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> I bet Kat was pretty proud of you too. She was. She was like, Ooh, look at you. And I was like, I know, I know. right. I don't mean to brag, but I just fixed her dryer. I mean, it was stupid, easy to fix, but Still, it was one of those things. It was, it was a success. It was a win and it was a small one, but I celebrated it, you know, um, cause it just felt really good to, to, to not be a handy kind of guy, but to do something nice handy job and, and probably save ourselves a couple hundred bucks at least. Yeah. So, yeah. Tim, the tool man, and you didn't <laughs> blow up the house and you didn't, no. you know, superpower the dryer. So it nope. like is breathing flames or something. <laughs> None of that. Good job. But we did have like, I don't I like know, that one. 12 loads of laundry to do this weekend. <laughs> it's so much laundry. 
<laughs> it was ridiculous. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. And please like and review and share and subscribe and all of those things that make Middle-ish um, accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you'd like, um, you can uh, join, join in listener support, which is um, just kind of like a personal sponsorship for Middle-ish, um, a monthly thing. You can uh, access that in the show notes below. And we would really appreciate um, financial support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week.